A listener's note before we begin. The following episode contains adult themes and content of a violent nature. It may not be suitable for everyone. Listener discretion is advised. Hey everyone, Sarah here. It's March 2nd and we have some breaking news about this story that I want to share with you. In episode 10, we told you that Nova Scotia's independent police watchdog, the Serious Incident Response Team, or CERT, started investigating the RCMP shooting at the Onslow Belmont Fire Hall on April 19th. More than 10 months later, they're finally finished. If you're just joining us for the first time, you'll likely want to go back and listen to episode 10 and the rest of the series for context. But for now, my producer Alex Kress is joining me to talk about this new report. So, Alex, what have we learned? So, CERT has determined the two RCMP officers who shot at the fire hall on the morning of April 19th will not face criminal charges. The report says the officers responded reasonably to an emergency. The officers believed that the person they were shooting at was the killer, someone who would continue his killing rampage. This is a quote from the end of the report. They discharged their weapons in order to prevent further deaths or serious injuries. The totality of the evidence establishes that the officers had reasonable grounds to believe the person they saw who was disobeying their orders was the mass murderer who had, in the preceding hour, killed three more persons. Viewed objectively in light of the protections afforded to peace officers by Section 25 of the Criminal Code, the totality of the circumstances in what was a rapidly unfolding series of events establishes that the officers had a lawful excuse when they discharged their firearms. Accordingly, no criminal offense was committed and no charges are warranted against either officer, end quote. The CERT report confirms some of what witnesses and surveillance video already told us about what happened. Okay, so let's back up. Here's an overview of what this report says happened that morning. These two RCMP officers, they're called Subject Officer 1 and Subject Officer 2 in this report. They were called in at 3 a.m. to help investigate the killings in Portapik. CERT says they were traveling together in an unmarked Nissan Altima. Back in episode 10, Sharon McClellan told us that she thought it was a Hyundai she saw on the road that day. We now know that's not quite right, but it was an unmarked car they were driving. The report also says that the first officer, Subject Officer 1, had learned through an interview he did with the gunman's common-law partner earlier that morning that the gunman was wearing an orange reflective vest and was driving a fully marked replica RCMP vehicle. The CERT report says the two officers got involved in the active search for the gunman after Lillian Campbell was killed in Wentworth, which we know was at around 9.35 a.m., The report says they went to the scene in Wentworth, and then they were among the officers who were called to Glenholm. You may remember from episode 9 that a couple in Glenholm called 911 at 9.48 a.m. because they saw the gunman come onto their property and try to get into the house. He left before police arrived, but when police got on scene at the couple's home, they thought the gunman was still pinned down on the property somewhere. Not long after these two RCMP officers left Glenholm, they learned that two people had been found dead on Plains Road in DeBert. That was Kristen Beaton and Heather O'Brien. The CERT report says, quote, They knew at this point that the serial killer had murdered three more persons in the space of less than 30 minutes, unquote. Let me just take a moment here to say that this is the language that's being used in the CERT report, but the gunman in Nova Scotia is not a serial killer. By definition, that's someone who murders two or more people in separate events with what the FBI refers to as a cooling off period in between. One retired FBI profiler we spoke to earlier in the series said the Nova Scotia gunman would technically be called a spree killer because the shootings took place over a large distance, but within the 13 hours. So the officers drove to DeBert, but the CERT report says that instead of going to the scene of the latest shootings, they started searching the area for the gunman. That's when they started driving toward Onslow. Now, the report doesn't say why they went to Onslow, but we know that at 10.21 a.m., the same time the shooting at the fire hall started, the RCMP tweeted that the gunman may be in the DeBert or central Onslow area. These two officers got to the fire hall right around 10.20 a.m., so by this time they would have been working since they'd been called in at 3 a.m. in an extremely stressful situation and likely without a break. 
And the report explains that this was a case of mistaken identity at the fire hall. As the two officers got close to the Onslow Belmont Fire Brigade Hall on Highway 2, they saw there was a marked RCMP cruiser in the parking lot and a man wearing a yellow and orange reflective vest standing by the driver's side door. This was the EMO coordinator we told you about in episode 10. CERT says they couldn't tell if there was someone in the car or if the door was open because they were more than 88 meters away. Just to give you an idea, a football field is 91 meters long, so they were almost a football field away when this happened. The two officers stopped in the car in the middle of the road, just like the witnesses told us in episode 10. The CERT report says they tried using their radios to tell other officers what they were seeing, but they couldn't get through because the radio, quote, bonged. That's the word they used in the report. Okay, Alex, what does that mean, the radio bonged? Well, the report says bonging out or being bonged out can mean one of two things. Either the radio is in a poor coverage area and can't communicate with the radio tower, or the radio tower is at capacity and does not have what the report calls an available talk path. It says later in the report that CERT has concluded the officers were unable to communicate with other RCMP officers at the time of the shooting because of the volume of radio traffic on the tower. The report says the officers then yelled police and yelled, show your hands, but that the EMO coordinator, quote, did not show his hands, but rather ducked behind the marked police car, then popped up and ran toward the fire hall entrance, unquote. And this is when the officers started shooting. So they fired five shots. Subject officer one fired four shots. Officer two fired one. The bullets hit an electronic sign where they were crouched in the parking lot and a monument on the far side near the main doors. Two shots went through the fire hall doors and into a fire truck, and one hit the side wall near that monument. There are a bunch more holes in the wall next to the monument that look to be from shrapnel. So did the CERT report answer any more of the questions that we had? For instance, who was doing the shooting? No. The RCMP officers who fired their guns that day have not been identified by CERT or by the RCMP. Even the men who were inside the fire hall at the time say they haven't been told who was shooting at them. In episode 10, we heard what the morning was like for Onslow Fire Chief Greg Muse and Deputy Chief Daryl Curry. So how is this news sitting with them? Well, they had heard that the officers weren't going to be charged before this report was released. And we spoke to them about it when we were preparing episode 10. And we asked them at that time what they thought. How does that land with you? How does that feel? I'm, I'm pretty confused, yeah. Daryl and Greg told us that CERT didn't ask them many questions during its investigation. So now, after almost a year of wondering what would come of it, they're no closer to having any closure. It adds another whole cover-up to the story, in my opinion. Sarah, these guys say they've been through hell. They've been really open about that with us. And when we had that conversation before the results were released, they said how much it stung to learn there wouldn't be charges. Yeah, I didn't sleep well last night. <laughs> I know, actually, after the meeting with you the other day, I had just been gone right back to where I was the day it happened. That news just sort of flattened things again. Yeah. And that's what really sticks out in my mind. They said that this news feels like a setback in dealing with what they've described as the worst moments of their lives. I remember thinking when I was in there, how am I going to die? Is it going to be fast? Am I going to to see this person? Uh, Am I going to lay bleeding on the floor? I I remember thinking that to myself in there, like, how am I going to die here? Because I assumed I was going to. I also talked to Sharon McClellan about the CERT investigation. She's the neighbor who lives across the street from the fire hall, and she witnessed the entire shooting. She had some interesting things to say about what was going on behind the scenes in the CERT investigation. Back in the late fall, the lead investigator had to return to work with the Halifax Regional Police, and a new investigator took over. Sharon said this new investigator didn't want to do another interview with her, and she told me she felt right then that she knew what the conclusion of the report would be. Nothing's going to happen. They're not going to be reprimanded. They're, they, you know, they're back to work. You know, nothing's going to happen. They're not going to get retrained. Nothing. They're, they're not going to be held accountable. And that's pretty sad. I would be very shocked if this report came out and they were going to be retrained or get anything for it. I would be very shocked. Because at that moment when he sent me that email, I knew right then and there. You know, 
no transparency whatsoever, right? That's the way it is with the RCMP. Now, Sharon told me she wants these officers to be retrained, and she wants to see other officers retrained too, because she worries this could happen again, and next time an innocent bystander could be killed. We don't know if the RCMP will update its training methods after what happened at the fire hall. Since April, they've been refusing to talk about what happened because of the CERT investigation. We do know that Superintendent Darren Campbell said back on April 24th that there would be an internal review. So in the course of any of those types of referrals to CERT, uh, when there's a discharge of firearm, there's always a review, and there's always a review of the status of those officers. But so far, the RCMP haven't said what the result of that review is. We asked them a series of questions today about training and the status of these officers, but they didn't respond in time for this recording. Stay tuned for the final three episodes of 13 Hours Inside the Nova Scotia Massacre in the coming weeks. Episode 11 is out March 15th. Thanks for listening.